Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Welcome to The Vine, our online campus here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church. And today we're coming from a different site. We're coming from what we like to call the Woo. That stands for Wrightsville on Oleander, our extension campus on Oleander Drive here in Wilmington, North Carolina. And so we're here today because uh, Tropical Storm Debbie has come through and we um, wanted to protect uh, the building there at Wrightsville Beach. And so we've got that all locked up. So we're coming to you from Oleander and we're really proud of this facility and glad to be able to show it off to you today. Um, we're continuing with um, August camp meeting month. So you see I'm not wearing a robe and we're also um, sharing our personal testimonies as pastors. Today it's my turn to tell you about why I'm a United Methodist. So um, I hope that you'll enjoy today's service and that you will feel the presence of God um, throughout this, this time together. So uh, stay with us for the next 30 minutes or so and uh, let's worship together. Will you pray with me? Gracious Heavenly Father, it seems like we're always going through different storms of life. Some of them figurative, some of them very literal. This week we came through Tropical Storm Debbie and I pray that folks are doing well after this storm. Lord, for many of us, the storms that rage around us um, are very different. Um, storms that take place at work, relationships at home, um, dealing with worries about our country and our world. Lord, you showed in your son that you can calm the storm. And so we ask that you will bring order to the chaos around us. Lord, help us to step into a new tomorrow with faith, hope, and love. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Hello, my name is Jeff Turpin. From the sound of my voice, you may think I'm from the mountains. However, I'm a city boy born and raised in Charlotte. Uh, my wife, Jane, and I, along with our three kids, moved here 30 years ago so I could take a new, a new CFO job in the area. Early years for me, my family didn't attend church when I was growing up. Most Sundays were spent helping my father with his many projects. Sundays was his, uh, really his only day off. This was great fixer-up training for me, but no church. Um, I think my earliest God memory was in second grade, just after we moved to another part of Charlotte. After my first school day, I walked out the wrong school door, got lost. Not sure where this came from, but I specifically went to God to get me home in second grade. In middle school, I hung around groups that were, I guess, were not ideal. But looking back today, God was always with me, preventing my poor choices, poor group choices from leading me to uh, serious outcomes. Independent years, moving forward to the all important age of 16. Started working at Arby's and then Winn-Dixie. You remember those guys, the B people? Both great life experiences. At Winn-Dixie is where I met Jan. Every time the store manager hired a new cashier, it was time to look for a, girl, a new girlfriend potential. While bagging groceries, I had lots of opportunity to sweet talk the cashiers. Obviously, I was looking for a pretty girlfriend that would stick with me. Jan was the, uh, was the last cashier for me. She kept me. That's where introduction to church comes from. My church attendance started with and continues with Jan. She invited me to attend church, um, Covenant Presbyterian Church. If you know the Charlotte area, you know this large Gothic revival architecture design church with a long celebrated tr tradition at the corner of Moorhead and Dilworth. You can't miss it. At first, it was quite unsettling to attend the church and what to wear, which pew to take, where to stand, what to recite. Uh, one, um, Jane invited me to a Christmas Eve service. I was thinking, what's this about? She says, everyone goes to church on Christmas Eve. I go, okay, got it. She invited me to a communion service. She tells me during the service, just take a small piece of bread. I said, okay, I got it. 
So that was my first church, real church experience. College. Finished high school, then off to college. I continued to work at Winn-Dixie. The college accounting study was quite challenging for me. Um, throughout college, I had yet to join a church and did not regularly attend. However, I did not stop constantly turning to God, asking for his help with my studies. Um, finished school, went to work for Deloitte in early 1982. A real blessing from God, just what I was wanting. Baptized and joined the church. Two years later, I was baptized before the session, then joined the church. This, this may sound a bit strange, but I, after the baptism, I felt like I'd been to the dental hygienist for my whole self. Um, after joining, uh, I attended a new members class dinner. That was, that was typical. After the dinner, I was given a pledge card. The Presbyterians do a little bit different. I thought to myself, what's this? Hmm, how much do I put on that card? No clue. At first, I had no under at that time I had no understanding of the concepts of first fruit, proportional giving, or that giving was an essential part of worship. So what did I do? I go to Jan. Can you ask your dad, a longtime Presbyterian, what I should put on the card? He'll know. Uh, shortly thereafter, Jan and I were married in the church. We later joined a new, a new Sunday school class, uh, young adults. I came to class with little knowledge of the Bible. Most of the class members were young, confident, all dressed up professionals. Back in those days, we all wore suits. I think I had a three P, I was three P suits. The church members would frequently lead this new class once the senior minister came to lead the class. Very much an intellectual type minister, technical minister. Early, early in his discussion, he asked the group, what did God ask Abraham to do? Hmm. Dead silence in that group. The entire group, let's say there was 20 members in this class, did not know the story. I wonder what the minister thought. You, you all know the answer. It was just one word. Simple answer. Go! And afterwards, Abraham received God's great blessing for himself and his descendants, and ultimately for all of us. <coughs> Later in 1988, I was elected a ruling elder at Covenant Presbyterian for a six-year term. Served on the finance committee and as church treasurer for a few years. As a young elder in the session, I didn't have a clue as to the church government or doctrine. During the session meetings, I was basically in awe of the skill and knowledge of other session members. I kept a low profile, probably sat in the back, no questions for me, just listen and learn. Later, 1995, we moved to Wilmington, joined San Andrews Covenant Presbyterian Church. We were members there until we joined uh, this church in 2023. During that time, I was elected. I had deacon, deacon, then elder, then church treasurer for like 18 years. I lost count. Um, I also served on the pres on presbytery committees and as the treasurer for the presbytery for many years. We attended Sunday school class and took all the disciple books, the red book, the yellow book, the green book, the purple book, all the colors. We took them all. The disciple books and the classmates provided me with a good understanding of the Bible. Later, I was asked to lead a Sunday school class. That was just one, one time I was asked. From there, I joined in on part of the regular, uh, regular leader rotation. We followed the lectionary, so your assignment was your assignment. No skipping any hard Bible passages. What you got was what you got. It was a bit of a competition as your class presentation and understanding the Bible text. The members of this Sunday school class knew the Bible, so being prepared was essential. Later, employment. The CFO job that I took when I first came to town led to the CEO job and then to the building of a store count from 125 stores to 430 stores in eight states. With this many stores and the geography, employees, countless things could go wrong. Throughout my tenure, I had full confidence that, that God would provide me with the necessary skills and the fellow employees to solve all these problems. Wrap up. Number one, where am I at today? For sure, I know the Abraham story. Got that for sure. A member of this church, regular Bible study attendee, and still learning, trying to catch up. It seems to me, or it seems like the more I know, the less I know. I struggle with the many Bible passages, such as Ephesians 1, 4. For God chose us and him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. Hmm. Jeff was chosen before the foundation of the world. 
and he is to be and he is holy and blameless before God. Wow. Jeremiah 1 5. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before my first thought, before my first thought, God knew me. Now, what about uh, John 27, 28? My sheep, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them. They follow me. Boy, I hope I hear Jesus' voice. And what about men's concept, concepts of universalism, double predestination, or it's all up to me? Kind of Presbyterian topic, so we'll go through that quick. It could be over. It could be a bit overwhelming at times. Number two, hopefully I get this right, and this is the wrap up. In a prior sum, in a prior sum, and Doug mentioned that another pastor or professor stated, "If you ask God for something, I guess in prayer, or um, you will receive it, or something better." I go. I was, I, I've been thinking about that for at least two years. I think it was three years ago. I have dwelled on that, face, that phrase ever since. And now I've come to believe that the professor was exactly right. And, and by the way, if Doug didn't say it, I'll take full credit for it now. Uh, I asked for help in second grade when I got lost. Help is granted. God was with me in middle school, so no big trouble. I got the pretty girlfriend who's still with me today. Finished college, grand employment, blessed with three healthy children, and now three healthy grandchildren, and I was gifted with skills that have allowed me to serve the church, financial skills. I'm sure there are 100,000 or a million other blessings to God's credit, but I was only given eight minutes, including my walk-up time to tell my story, and I think I'm at nine minutes. My cup is truly runneth over. Thanks. Ezekiel saw the wheel way up in the middle of the air. Ezekiel saw the wheel way in the middle of the air. The big wheel run by faith and the little wheel run by the grace of God. A wheel within a wheel way in the middle of the air. But a man might be running how you walk along the cross way in the middle of the air. Your foot might slip and your soul get lost way in the middle of the air. Ezekiel saw the wheel way up in the middle of the air. Ezekiel saw the wheel way in the middle of the air. The big wheel run by faith and the little wheel run by the grace of God. A wheel within a wheel way in the middle of the air. Better mind my sister what a hypocrite will do way in the middle of the air. He'll low rate me and he'll low rate you way in the middle of the air. Ezekiel saw the wheel way Church. My name is Eunice Kang. I'm one of the associate pastors here. It is my great privilege to get to lead us in prayer today. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, we come before you today, heart open and spirit lifted, grateful for the gift of your grace that fills our lives. Thank you, Lord, for the love that welcomes us each day, for the grace that has been with us even before we knew it. Your grace is a soft whisper of hope, a steady hand that guides us, a shelter in the storm. We confess that there are times we take this grace for granted, times we forget how deeply we are loved by you. Forgive us, Lord, and open our eyes to see the countless ways your grace touches our lives. Lord, we pray for peace in places torn by war and conflict. Let your grace be a beacon of hope. May those who are suffering in these areas feel your presence and be comforted by your love. Lord, we lift up those who are affected by Hurricane Debbie, whose lives have been disrupted and turned upside down. Let your grace be their refuge and strength Provide them with the support they need 
and surround them with a community that cares and acts with compassion. Today, we ask that you fill us anew with your grace. Let it flow into every corner of our heart, cleansing us of worry, fear, and doubt. And now we especially pray for those whom we name with our voices or hold in our heart. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Help us remember the assurance that your grace goes before us, surrounds us, and follows us. We humbly offer this prayer in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now take a moment to offer our heart and gift. As we respond to God's grace and generosity, you can contribute to the ministry of Ricefield United Methodist Church through our website and by mail. Let us continue to worship our God. I'm Pastor Eunsu. How are you today? I'm so excited to share this time with y'all. So today, I want to do something fun with you. Can you imagine holding a gift in your hands that you can't see? Okay, let's all pretend to hold an invisible gift. Can you hold out your hands like this and close your eyes and imagine a very special gift you really want is in your hands right now? Hmm. Okay, and now open your eyes. How does it feel to imagine that? It makes you so happy, right? Even though you, we can't see this gift, we can still imagine it's there and it makes us so happy. In the same way, God gives us a special gift we can feel but we can't see. This gift is called, by, called God's grace. Have you ever heard the word grace before? Grace is God's love and kindness that we don't have to earn. It's a gift just because God loves us so much. What's even more amazing is God's grace is with us even before we knew it. It's like when your parents loved you even before you were born. And God's grace is always there guiding us and helping us to find our way even when we don't realize it. It is so cool, right? And this grace is not for some people. It's for everyone. It doesn't matter who you are and where you come from. God's grace is for each one of us and every one of us. So let's do this to remember this. So everyone put your hands um, on your heart. Now close your eyes and think about someone you love. It could be a family member or your friend, or even your pet. Mm, can you feel this very warm feeling inside? That's a, a little bit like God's grace. It's always there, filling us with love and kindness. So now let us a prayer to thank God for this, His amazing grace. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for loving us. And thank you for being with us even before we knew that. Help us to remember this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our key verses for today come from the Gospel according to John, chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Hear the word of the Lord. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your, heart, in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So we have a tradition here at Wrightsville of asking church members to give testimonies in the month of August to talk about how God has been at work in their lives. You've recently heard from one of our um, church members named Jeff Turpin, who's told you about how God's been at work in his life. This year, I thought it'd be cool to also hear testimonies from our pastors. And then I realized something, that all of the pastors on staff, except for me, were once part of another denomination. So that made me think, you know, I'd love to hear why each pastor changed from the denomination that they grew up in to the United Methodist Church that they're a part of today. And so I hope you're enjoying this series. But like I said, my story is a little different from all the others. You see, I have been United Methodist my entire life. I was baptized at First United Methodist Church in High Point, North Carolina, just three years after the Methodist Church and the Evangelical United Brethren combined to form the United Methodist Church. My mother still attends the church that I grew up in. She also grew up in that church. Her father started attending there when he left the farm in Albemarle at age 16 to continue his education at High Point College. He was Methodist. High Point College was a Methodist school. So naturally, he started attending the downtown Methodist church. Our family's been attending that church now for 97 years. But our Methodist roots go even deeper than that. You see, my great, 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 great grandfather was Henry Daub, the brother of Peter Daub, who started Methodist churches throughout Piedmont, North Carolina, like West Market Street in Greensboro and Wesley Memorial in High Point. He also founded Greensboro College, which is one of the first colleges for women in North Carolina. As you all know by now, my family has always been very involved in the local church. When I was a teenager, I became the youth representative to the administrative council. My grandfather was the administrative council chair. Later, my mom would become the administrative council chair. My dad was the trustee chair. He was also a Sunday school teacher, and you've heard the stories of his mission work both in High Point and in the Appalachian Mountains. Church has always been a big part of our lives. I used to tell people that my mom might let me stay home sick from school, but I'd have to be lying in a hospital bed dying to be able to stay home from church. When I was in high school, I felt a call to ministry, and I went to talk to my Sunday school teacher about it. He said, I remember going through that phase when I was your age. Since everything seemed to be a phase at that age, I didn't take the call very seriously and decided to look for other ways that God might use me in the future until I got to college. You know, sometimes when we go off to college, we decide to sleep in on Sundays. Well, maybe not you, but some people do. Or we might begin to try other denominations for the first time. I tried a lot of the parachurch organizations at UNC Chapel Hill, like InterVarsity and Campus Crusade. They weren't for me. I appreciated that they wanted to be different from the world, but something was missing. I wasn't quite sure what it was at the time. I also had the opportunity to go with friends to other churches, Baptist, Presbyterian, Catholic. But the worship and preaching that I connected with most took place at the United Methodist Church that's right on the campus of UNC Chapel Hill. They had a preacher there that I really liked, and as life would have it, he would later become my district superintendent and good friend. Many of you know the story by now that after graduating Carolina and a year of law school at Wake Forest, I decided to take a summer job as the program director at Camp Chestnut Ridge outside of Chapel Hill. It was there that I reconnected with my faith and a call to ministry that led me to drop out of law school and enroll at Duke Divinity School instead. I've never looked back. But why did I stay here? What has made me so protective of this denomination, even proud of it at times? Nowadays, some people would consider me a leader in the denomination, or at least in our conference. So there must be something about it that's very important to me. And there is. 
First of all, I think the thing about United Methodism that I find most appealing is that we take seriously God's grace. Pastor David elaborated on this last week when he told his story, so I'll be brief here. But in the scripture that we just read, John chapter 3, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, a member of the religious order of the Pharisees, about some very important spiritual truths. Now, the Pharisees believed you had to live according to every one of the 613 laws of the Old Testament in order to remain in God's good graces. But Jesus says to Nicodemus, you don't understand what it means to receive God's grace. He emphasizes this point in verse 16 when he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And in verse 17, he goes on to say, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. In those two verses, the word world shows up four times. God loved the world. God sent his Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but to save the world. In the very first chapter of the Bible, we learn that God made the whole world. He doesn't want to destroy it or ignore it or let it destroy itself. In fact, he calls it good, very good indeed. He wants all the people of the world to live with him forever. So he says, believe in his son Jesus and you will not perish, but have eternal life. Believe and live. Do you have to live a perfect life? Nope. The Bible doesn't say that. Although if you've been given such a precious gift as eternal life, you're going to want to say thank you by living a life pleasing to God. Nevertheless, if you make a mistake, if you miss the point, if you sin, God will forgive you if you believe in His Son, Jesus, and you can still go on to live with Him forever. You don't have to earn this love. It's freely given to you. I like this. It's just too hard to live a perfectly disciplined, holy and righteous life like the Pharisees tried to do. Maybe, just maybe, I can stay away from committing sin. You know, stealing, lying, killing, coveting, etc. But what about all the things I should do but don't? All the times and places where I should be helping someone or praying for someone or forgiving someone or maybe even lovingly confronting someone with the truth. What if I miss a Sunday at church? Do I have to march in every worthy cause for justice? Is giving 10% of my income to the church enough? What if I have the means to give more? Where should I volunteer my time today? At the church? At the hospital? At the food pantry? At the local school? What about my family members who are sick or grieving or struggling with addiction or struggling to make ends meet? What should I do? Because I just can't do it all. I can't get it right all the time. I cannot live a perfectly disciplined, holy, and righteous life. That doesn't mean I should just give up and not try to do good at all, of course. That's what Dietrich Bonhoeffer called cheap grace. But it sure is nice to know that God is going to love me no matter what, whether I do right or whether I do wrong. The second thing I like about United Methodists is that we believe God's grace is for everybody. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, affirmed that God's grace is universally present in all. In fact, he believed that God's grace was present in all creation. This is important. I just read to you where God said, where, excuse me, where Jesus said that God loved the whole world. And then he went on to say that whoever or whosoever, depending on your translation, believes in Jesus will not perish but have eternal life. I take that whosoever really seriously. If you believe in Jesus, you're in. Jesus himself said it. Whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Whosoever. That's you, me, kid down the street, guy on the other side of the world. Whosoever. The Pharisee, the sinner, the righteous, the unrighteous. Whosoever. The child, the elderly, the disabled, the person in the prime of life. Whosoever. Rich, poor, black, white, Asian, Hispanic. Whosoever. 
Man, woman, gay, straight, single, married, whosoever. Baptist, Catholic, Presbyterian, Episcopalian, Pentecostal, non-denominational, Lutheran, Amish, Mormon, Mennonite, Disciples of Christ, Eastern Orthodox, AME, AMEZ, Quaker, Shaker, Wesleyan, Nazarene, United or Global Methodist. More than a hundred other denominations I could name. Whosoever. But what if they've done this or they've never done that? Apostle Paul says in Romans 8 that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Did you hear that? Nothing can separate us. Nothing. Now there's one important thing to understand here. While God so loved the world or every person on the planet, all of us probably will not be saved or have this eternal life that Jesus is talking about. Why is that? Because salvation and eternal life are a choice that we make. The first key word was whosoever. The second key word is believes. God puts it out there for all of us. God wants everybody to choose him. But sadly, some won't. You have to choose to believe in Jesus. If you don't want to accept God's gift of grace, you don't have to take it. God gave us free will. We're not robots who are programmed or forced to accept God's love. But God, your creator, really, really wants you to choose him. That's why God made you, to be in a loving relationship with you. So if you're on the fence, I say go for it. What have you got to lose? The third thing, if you take seriously God's grace and you believe it's available to everyone, is recognizing that the kingdom of God is not something we have to wait for in heaven. In fact, Jesus has already inaugurated the kingdom and God works through Jesus' disciples to make the world today more like the kingdom of heaven. This is important because many denominations believe that if the world gets bad enough, Jesus will come back and take all his believers to heaven. Therefore, they don't do anything to make the world better now, but instead look at certain problems around the world as signs that Jesus must be coming soon. Unfortunately, the Bible doesn't support this theory at all. Jesus will come back someday, but he's not waiting on the world to get to its lowest point possible. Instead, the Bible consistently talks about people of faith making the world, especially their community, a better place now. Jesus himself preaches this over and over again, and then he goes out and he heals the sick, and feeds the hungry, and brings good news to the poor. He doesn't want things to get worse. Remember, God loves the world, and he sent his son to save the world, not to condemn it. Jesus then taught his disciples ways to make the world better, and then we read about them doing just that in the book of Acts and in the letters of the New Testament. John Wesley took this seriously in the 1700s. He developed five kinds of programs to serve the poor, which he operated out of the foundry, his very first church in London. The five things were his church provided food, clothing, and shelter for the most destitute, especially those unable to work. He provided materials and seed money to start up small businesses or to keep businesses from closing. They provided schools for the children of the poor. Remember, schools weren't a universal thing back then. He brought in literacy programs for adults and free medical clinics for the poor. That's what they did in his first church. He also frequently preached against the horrors of slavery. That's how Methodism started. And it is in lockstep with Jesus' proclamation that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Over the years, Methodists have led the charge to bring an end to child labor, for creating a fair wage, and for having safety standards in the workplace. Leading hospitals in cities like Houston, San Antonio, Columbus, Memphis, Indianapolis, Atlanta, Durham, and many other places were started by Methodists. Some of the best universities in America, like Duke, Emory, SMU, Syracuse, and Southern Cal, were all started by Methodists. We believe in making the world a better place. 
This is why I'm so proud of our work at Wrightsville with Teach Reads and Snipes Academy, why I've traveled to Sierra Leone to meet the people who are working in our hospital in Rotafunk, why I love that we feed people right here through Mother Hubbard's Cupboard and Nourish NC, why we have a group that's dedicated to racial justice, why we got involved in housing the homeless through Eden Village and bought a van for Link to help people re-enter society after spending time in prison. I could go on and on, but this is what Methodism is all about, making a difference while making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. It's a movement I'm excited about, and even with all our debates, discussions, and divisions, I love being a part of it, and I hope you do too. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, there are many ways that we can choose to worship you. And Lord, I pray that you will bless each and every one of them. But I ask especially that you pour out your grace on the United Methodist Church and help us to live into the lives that you've called us to, to be a church that is about making disciples and transforming this world so that it is more like on earth as it is in heaven. In your name we pray, amen. So John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, believed very seriously in God's grace, that unmerited love that God pours out, and believed that it was for anybody and everybody. And that furthermore, that we could all work together to be more like Jesus and make this world more like the kingdom of heaven. Jesus inaugurated it himself and asked his disciples to be a part of it. So I hope you will. And whether you choose to be United Methodist or something else, that's totally cool, but I hope that you will take seriously God's grace, that it's for everybody, and that all of us together, including you, can make a difference in this world. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.